He said something real key in there, though. You'd have to know someone well enough yeah. and get to a point of knowing how to love them, or they would have had to express a need that then exactly. you feel called to meet. And I think that's yeah. where we often fall down in life. Is as Christians, we see the Word of God, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor and yourself. There it is. It's all summed up. But no one's spending the time to get to know their neighbors, whoever you want to, you know, determine your neighbor is, right? And they're not in that point of understanding and having a depth of relationship. And you ask people like, hey, what's their story? And really, they don't know a story. They know a couple of facts. Oh, they moved here from Chicago and their kids are out of the house now or whatever, you know? Yeah. And it's like, but yeah. what's their story? Where are they living in pain? Where are they living in unbelief of who God is and who he's created them to be and things like that? I think this gives me... Well, so yeah, it's a, a lot, lot of work. About. It takes a lot of work. I mean, we know that in neighborhoods that we lived in. And honestly, not everyone is receptive to being known. <laughs> That's right. But it doesn't mean you stop trying. Welcome to the Everyday Disciple Podcast, where you'll learn how to live with greater intentionality and an integrated faith that naturally fits into every area of life. In other words, discipleship as a lifestyle. This is the stuff your parents, pastors, and seminary professors probably forgot to tell you. And now, here's your host, Caesar Kalinowski. All right, here we go. I gotta say, it's been a good week that we've had over here. My new book, Slow Burn, Relaxing into Theology, came out this past week. And guess what? It hit number one in three categories. Praise God, my first number one book, on Amazon at least. And I want to thank you if you bought a copy and helped it jump up the charts. I've been getting a lot of messages to emails, social posts from people who have got the book already. And they are digging it, and they're diving straight into community with others, following along that whole process that we outline in there and the 12 conversations that we completely outlined for you. So I hope you'll grab a copy. If you've not, It's you can go over to Amazon and get that right now, either the paperback or the Kindle. And you can get both of those also at missiopublishing.com, missiopublishing.com, just like it sounds. And they have great prices there. And that's also where you can get five and 10 packs and cases and such and free shipping. All right. Amazon, you just got to buy one-offs. But if you want to do this in community, get a bunch of different leaders using this. Uh, you're going to get crazy discounts over at missiopublishing.com. Also, got to say how fun and exciting it's been in our coaching cohort here these last several weeks. Everyday Disciple Makers is our coaching, and so many couples who are doing the story of God right now in their communities are seeing such breakthroughs. So many people who are either far from God, starting to walk towards Jesus and understand who he is and want him to be their savior, and also a bunch of Christians in their communities waking up to like, are you kidding me? Is this really the story? It seems like for us and so many people that we've coached, their community life, both with believers and not yet believers, is sort of divided now before they did the story of God and after we did the story of God. It's such a marker for helping people. So it's been so exciting. It just happens to be a time right now when a whole bunch of people are doing the story of God in their communities. And we've just been getting flooded with all oh, so many good news sort of reports and evidences of grace. <laughs> oh, I'd love to tell you more about that. And if you're interested in the coaching that we offer, Tina and I coach together as couples and we coach couples, go ahead and go over to everydaydisciple.com forward slash coaching, everydaydisciple.com forward slash coaching. There'll be a bunch of other information there for you and how it all works and uh, see if this would be a good fit for you. Okay. Today's topic and episode is pretty special to me. I've got Charlie Peacock and his wife, Andy, on. Now, Charlie Peacock, some of you know who he is when I say that. He's a really good songwriter, singer, musician, record producer, and I've known him forever. Back in my <laughs> one of my previous lives when I was a record producer, I got to know Charlie Peacock and even went on the road touring with him a little bit. If you don't know Charlie, he is really good. He is a really good artist. He's done tons and tons of records, and he has written songs for a variety of genres. He wrote for DC Talk, for Margaret Becker, Philip Bailey, Out of the Gray, Bourgeois Tag, on and on and on. And his songwriting career really took off when he wrote Every Heartbeat for Amy Grant. 
became a major hit on the charts, Billboard's Hot 100. I think it made it to number two. And he became a very proven, one of the top producers in Nashville for all kinds of music and certainly lots of Christian music. He's produced close to 50 albums worth of stuff in all kinds of different gospel and contemporary Christian categories. He's got a lot of Grammys. Anyway, a really cool guy. And he and his wife, Andy, have been steeped in community the entire time. They've been making records and helping other artists and musicians chase their passions. And the three of us recently had a conversation about the power and beauty and importance of why everything we do in life matters and has significance in God's economy. And I love how everything they said fits into living a lifestyle of discipleship and our understanding of how life is full of opportunities for disciple-making and glorifying God. But they spin it and they speak about it from a very different perspective, and it really moved my heart. Charlie and Andy are both seasoned saints and gentle, and they're somewhat soft-spoken, and I think you're going to love their hearts And they stepped right up at the end of our talk and gave us a really cool big three for this episode all on their own. So make sure to listen to the full interview because near the end, Charlie lays on us the single most important thing he believes Christians miss about being a Christian. It's very insightful and I think it's really needed right now in the church. Take a listen. Welcome, Charlie. Good to meet you finally, Andy. And Charlie... I have not seen you face-to-face in so very long. Do you remember, I I was curious, I have to ask this right at the top, do you remember that time that Dave Bunker and I spent a few days out on tour with you and Jimmy and Vince and the band and and all that stuff? I do, I do, absolutely. I don't know exactly, that must have been around 93 or 2 or or something. Yeah, Uh, didn't someone loan us a uh, RV or... Yeah, yeah, a motorhome or something. Yeah, and I don't know if we all slept in it. You oh, guys maybe that was Jan Hotels. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I think yeah. we traveled with that darn thing. Yeah. And then, and then I have one super dominant memory that when our first record company, Graceland, was getting started, and we were right. trying to find artists we loved and felt passionate about, uh, yeah. you were very high on the top of the list. And I had approached you and sent you some emails about maybe because you were writing transitional time. And you sent me a no thanks, but no thanks letter, but I've saved it because it was so gracious and so (laughs) nice. I had never been told no for something I really wanted so bad in (laughs) such a nice way that it literally marked me, Charlie, because I felt like, you know what? It's not always yes for what we hope, but you don't, people don't have to always feel bad about it. Right. And so you were so gracious and kind about it. I was like, I feel so good right now, though I'm disappointed, you know? (laughs) And and well, I trust I'm glad God that you made the that. right choices, you know. <laughs> I'm glad you I'm glad you felt that way. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, hey, let's start out. Give us a little context for those who are joining us here on the podcast today. Give us a little context about your life, what it's like, where you live, kids, grandkids, jobs, or whatever. Like mm-hmm. just what's up in your lives right now? Yeah. The stage of life that we're in is uh we are in the mid part of our late uh sixties. And so for your listeners, I mean, we've had long careers uh, already. Um, we've raised children, built companies, nonprofits, have grandchildren. I was excited to hear uh, about this new book, Why Everything That Doesn't Matter Matters So Much, uh, The Way of Love in a World and Hurt. And it, just to let everyone know, it speaks to being a culture maker in our world today. And As I was like digging into this and looking at this, I'm like, wow, a a culture maker. That sounds pretty high and lofty for us mere mortals. (laughs) (laughs) What do you, what do you think it looks like or feels like to be a culture maker as a Christian today? And and in our world, we, we don't should on people, right? You know, he's like, well, you, you could look this way, you know, but maybe it's should, but (laughs) what do you think it looks and feels like to be a culture maker? First off. What I believe is that everyone is a culture maker and that it's not something that you set out to do. Like if you were setting out to be a culture maker, you have already made culture by interpreting culture making that way. <laughs> that's that's the way you've contributed by thinking that it's something that's out there that you're going to do rather than it's something that you're doing every 
day. So to me, the question is, what kind of culture are you making? Mm -hmm. And you yeah. shared a moment ago about um, some of your fellowship and community and how you are intentional in your neighborhoods and, and uh, intentional in friendship, intentional in neighborhood care and all of that. And that's very intentional culture making because you've given some thought to it. In other words, you, you've said, what kind of culture do I want to make and participate in? And I think that's really what's at stake when we talk about culture. It's not so much that we, like you say, like a high and lofty thing of like, okay, now we're going to go make culture. <laughs> it's really no, you're, you're, you're making it. Or as our friend David Dark says from an old television ad, you know, making culture. No, you're soaking in it. Yeah. yeah. We're all soaking in it. Yeah, uh, that's so true, then, right? So then it really becomes an issue of how are we contributing and what is the quality and quantity of that contribution? I love that. The parallel in our world is, that we talk about a lot is that you're kind of always in discipleship mode. <laughs> meaning people are watching your life. And so you're either leading into what it looks like to be submitted to God and his will and plan for the world and the kingdom, or you're kind of modeling and speaking what it looks like to build your own kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> or think you are at least. Right. Yeah. And so I, I, I like, I like this idea that we're all making a culture. And I, I think that my own life and with Tina and I, we feel like in some ways very young in our marriage and life, we were just trying to get by. And so there was no, there was no intentionality per se. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in light of what you're saying, I can see we were still creating a culture. <laughs> oh and, yeah. yeah. And yet by his, God's grace, it, it began to become a more intentional culture of how do we want to live and how do we want others to interpret our lives and interpret who God is through that and, and, and all those types of things. Yeah. One of the things, one of the things that's been really helpful for us as we help create active communities of faith on mission, uh, is is we found helpful to look at the seven pillars of culture. Now, we didn't define these ourselves, but I'm sure you've probably heard what these are. You know what I'm talking about. And, and they're family, education, business, media, and the arts. And you and I both, all of us, we've spent a lot of time in that. Healthcare, government, and then service organizations, which... Um, I don't know, the people who make this, these seven pillars put church in there, you know? Um, but we've found it healthy and helpful to look at the seven pillars that seem to be kind of existing in all, uh, you know, society, I guess, and help people find their places of passion and intentionality and influence within their cities and neighborhoods. Can you speak, maybe Charlie, to the theology of artistry and how that provides a framework for creative work for all of Jesus followers that that because uh, I think it's all creative too <laughs> but what's the theology of artistry and how does that speak to all of us yeah well artistry is a vocational calling and pursuit and it can manifest itself in a lot of different ways you know I mean, that can be choreography it could be music it could be fine arts uh, literature you know, all sorts of ways that we commonly think of culinary yeah, as the arts, but there's also an artist way in the world, I would say, an artist way of thinking that's been passed down through history, the way that artists embrace life. You, you'll find the arts are often forecast the future. They are oftentimes on the front end of controversial issues. And part of that is because artists are always starting from nothing towards something. You know, so they they participate in many ways very close to what we read in Genesis in terms of there being you know something or barely something, but you know that's that's kind of undefined and out of that God creates and so we have a you know theologians have a way of explaining this is that you know God creates out of nothing we create out of something and the something that we create out of is what. God has made, even if it's circumstance, even if it's just that God put you in this place and time, right? With these particular people, that's a part of it. So artists practice this vocation of making, and it might be like for me, you know, you know, you know my story. So I might get up every day and, and make music. Well, you can pretty quickly take that 
model of being in the world and apply it to every vocation. And this is something that Andy has studied a lot, um, both on her own and at seminary. And um, the idea that we all are creating a story with our life. And this vocational life is is a life of calling. In other words, but in order for there to be a calling, there has to be someone who calls. And so for us as Christians, we believe the person who calls is God himself. He's calling us to a particular life and at a particular time in history, and that there's going to be this unfolding story of our life, right? And some people will use words like, well, this is, you know, your legacy. This is the story that you've told with your life. And because it is like that, there are things that are in your control, things that are out of your control. You're resourced for some things. You're lacking in resources for others. People experience incredible tragedy. Some people go unscathed, seemingly unscathed through life. You know, we all come at it in different ways. But the idea is that you could be in, like you said, in healthcare, or you could be in the arts. And those arts could be music or culinary arts. And that can be a major part of the story that you tell with your life. And so that involves having craft. It, ha- it involves having skill and ability. And if you're a Christian, it involves having spirit. And it's being guided by God's spirit, using these skills and abilities in order to do this particular work of crafting, of making something. And that means that all of your imagination, all of your dreams, your aspirations for that particular thing, you know, are poured into it. I mean, that's how you get innovation. That's how you change the world in terms of if you're in the medical field, you know, you spend your entire life trying to break the code on a particular disease, right? Yeah. In the same way, uh, John Coltrane spent most of his life trying to break the code on how to extend the range of the tenor saxophone and what could be played on the saxophone, right? So that's a big part of the human project is the stewardship of all that God has made and and in some ways expanding what can be done, recovering what can be done, perfecting what can be done, and doing it all as unto God, an audience of one for the common good of all of God's creation out of love for God and neighbor. And that's that to me is is kind of the formula there. Love it. I, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, well, for a lot of people, they might think of vocation is something I do to go earn money. And maybe I do see aspects of my life as a maker or creative in all yeah. the different ways that I think it is. I think everybody's creative in some way in that sense. And do that, but do they have calling? Maybe Andy, speak to the importance of understanding vocation. Because in yes. the, the way I was raised, you know, in the Midwest, your vocation was what paid the bills. That's and then right. you had your passions. And if mm-hmm. you could fit some of that in, and oh my goodness, are you lucky if God uses it in some way? Because Monday you got to go back oh. to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's been such an important word for me to understand the meaning of. And it's as easily understood as knowing that, as Charlie said, God calls and we're responding. We're responding through the whole of our life, it's ever unfolding. We're responding through a place, through a city, through people, through a family, through being parents. You know, there's just so many ways, but then it narrows down in specificity to what is the life God is actually calling you to and what are all the different parts, what are all the different puzzle pieces. And so for me personally, that has looked like motherhood and has looked like uh hosting a great deal of people through a place called the art house in nashville tennessee for yeah about 24 years a very up close personal care for people cooking for people sitting with them in conversation changing their beds you know all of those things and needing to understand that that all has meaning and then being a grandmother being a writer being a person who's gone out and done speaking, but also understanding that it's not just that time where I'm away 
somewhere doing something that might have a title that's more easily understood, but it's the blend of all of these things. This is a life God has given me. And so my response to all those things is, it's my response to my calling. It's my response to following Jesus in my lifetime. And, you know, there are different looks and different seasons and different emphasis and different seasons, but there are some threads that go through um, sort of the deepest, deepest places of our uh, deeper, longer stories, which for me would be writing is one of them. And, uh, but then there are all the, these other things and I, we both, you know, take just as seriously our calling to be grandparents as we do our callings to do other things as well. We have to operate in the lanes that we've operated in for the last 40 years. And so there's a, an elevated respect, I guess, is what I come to for, for all these parts and not, I have really refused in my life to give a hierarchy of meaning to these different parts and um, maybe the parts that are more seen, but then life is made of all these different parts that nobody really sees or that you repeat every day as you, uh, you know, feed people or, re or make repair for life to continue on for another day, very life giving stuff. So, so I, I see all of it as very important in uh, part of what God's given me to do in the world and us together. Yeah, and, and you see that in the scriptures and in the illustration of the body, that is the body of Christ, and sort of the, the clear teaching that you know, if we if we gave more emphasis to the face, right, to the eyes, and then said, oh, yeah, but you know, who needs the thumb, really? You know, uh, well, as it turns out, no, you really need, you really need your thumb. Do without it for a day and you'll find it out, right? And it's the same in everything. I mean, this is why we have this, you know, sort of curious and playful title for the book is because we do want people to puzzle it for a moment and, and, and think, wait, okay, so yeah, have I sometimes said that, oh, that doesn't matter, you know, and then... And then come to find out that, oh, well, that mattered a lot, you know, and because it happens that way. And we, we really hope that our listeners and, and readers will grasp that, that these things that they've called small may in God's economy be quite big and might actually occupy a lot of meaning and be very important to the whole. Yeah. And I think we miss that. I think we miss the normalcy of things that God is at work in and calling us into. And if it's not like start the art house or, or start an orphanage or, you know, yeah, a feeding, exactly. you know, people discount that. And, and like we do, we rank it and we stack it. And then we begin to find our identity from that, which, you know, it's a slippery slope. right? Yeah, um, yeah. What would you say to God's opinion of sort of normalcy of life and the uh, details and why they matter to him and, and when I and I'm going to frame it a little bit, why they matter to him and why God cares about the details, in light of we really believe that God's ultimate goal of the whole thing, the whole gospel, and all of it is to fill the world with His glory. That's what's ha that's what's happening. That's what He's doing. I think that's what the discipleship's yeah. about. I think that's what image bearing's about. Why is God so concerned with the details of that and how that that takes place? Oh. Well, that's where he's given us to live. Like nobody lives in any other place other than the details of their daily life. And to, to think that God is not at work in those things is to think that Don, God doesn't really care about the life you're living every day as you do any particular thing that you might do. Because everything is full of the details that lay underneath it. And so I think he's concerned with the details because that, those are the details he's given us. And it's very hard to sometimes realize that God is at work in the ordinary and the slow and the, mm. you know, just the things that we might not make much of, but, but that fill our lives. Or it's also to see that as we've been called to feed the hungry and give drinks to the thirsty and care for the sick and all of those very practical things. There's many ways that 
that those can happen in a lifetime, but it doesn't ever bypass the way you're being called to that in daily life, in a, in a household or in a neighborhood. Or Yeah, I agree. I know yeah. hospitality is big to you, right, Andy? It, it has been. Yeah, it's, well, it's been a, a very huge part of my work. and My wife's so, too. Yeah. My wife is like hospitality yeah. plus it just oozes out of who she is. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't I'm not sure if I would have, you know, in the in the early very early days of my young life as a woman would have thought this is what I want to do. So that was more also the process of being called to it over time and responding and then becoming gifted along the way. But mm. it was there, very definitely a process of being called. And yeah, and, not, and I, having a lot of struggle inside of it too, to say this is really hard and there are tensions in here, but this is the calling. And so I'm going to be dependent on God and ask for his grace and ask him to show us how to, how to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I got a couple more things I want to ask okay. you here while I, while I've got you. So yeah. in in the book, it uh, talks quite a bit about expressing love, even in the midst of you know, today's sort of high levels of cynicism and fear and exhaustion that people feel, and, and many people feel oppressed by you know, systems, world systems, or others, and all. How do we go about? I know this is a pretty broad question, but how do we go about? in the normalcy of life and, and within calling and vocation, expressing love in light of that cultural soup and cynicism and fears. Yeah, to me, the downbeat is really Jesus in the summary of the law, of love of God and neighbor. And, you know, the Bible can be <laughs> ambiguous at times and complex, but there is just nothing ambiguous or complex about that. Carrying it out might have some complexity, but when we go to the Word of God and look for, for definitive teaching, I mean, I just can't, it can't be clearer than that, that the entire summary of the law is that we are to love God and to love neighbor. And so... What's that look like? What's that practically yeah. look like? Yeah. How well, about in your own life? What's that look like in your own life? I know you've got a lot yeah. of people coming into your world because of the way you live. So do we... Yeah. But how does that express itself, love of neighbor, for you guys? Yeah, well, love is a movement. And love is, is action. It's not a concept that doesn't have imagination and creativity attached to it. And by that, I mean, you can't love without imagining for someone or something, right? Um, no, if, what do you mean if, by that? If I'm, if I'm going to... If I'm going to to love you well, then I have to get to know you. I'd have to uh, find out what hurts you, what delights you. We'd have to get close enough to that. Or you'd have to expose a need to me that you were really interested in having someone meet that need. And that need might be anything from helping you get your car fixed to uh, a need for beauty in the midst of feeling like, wow, the world is, is really, really, really dark and dismal right now. So any of those kinds of things and a million more can find their genesis in love first and then imagining what we can do for one another or what we can do for a place. We can look around in our community and we can say, what does it mean to, to uh, make this a more welcoming place? Is it going forward to a, a more beautiful place, a helpful place? All of those things are really love based and start in the imagination first. And when we create, that's why I believe that, that the best creativity is rooted in love. And we use the imagination to figure out how it is that we're going to love well. What, what kind said, of good dream are, are you going to dream for me and Andy? You know? And you said something real key in there. What though. are we going to dream for you? You said something real key in there, though. You'd have to know someone well enough yeah. to get to a point of knowing how to love them, or they would have had to express a need that then exactly. you feel called to meet. And I think that's yeah. where we often fall down in life. Is as Christians, we see the Word of God, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor, you know, and yourself. There it is. It's all summed up. 
but no one's spending the time to get to know their neighbors, whoever you want to you know, determine your neighbor is, right? And they're not in that point of understanding and having a depth of relationship. And you ask people like, hey, what's their story? And really, they don't know a story. They know a couple of facts. Oh, they moved here from Chicago and their kids are out of the house now or whatever, you know? Yeah. And it's like, but yeah. what's their story? Where are they living in pain? Where are they living in unbelief of who God is and who he's created them to be and things like that? I think this gives me... Well, so, yeah, it's a lot, lot of work. About. It takes a lot of work. I mean, we know that from neighborhoods that we, we've lived in. And, and, not, and honestly, not everyone is receptive to being known. <laughs> That's right. But it doesn't mean you stop trying. It doesn't mean that you s- stop trying. And the same in a relationship. I mean, we've been talking about marriage a lot. And one of the things that we've been saying consistently is that to have a long marriage as we've had is, has meant to choose one another again. To have fresh seasons where we say, yeah, I, I still choose you. I love you. I, I want to be with you. Yeah. Uh, and Beautiful. I want to imagine again for what it means to love you. And so uh, that creates a whole new fresh season, intimacy, or fresh season of learning to know this season's version of one another, you know, because yeah. we're constantly changing. We hope that we're growing, we hope we're maturing, we hope we're you know, easier to get along with and that we listen better and argue our points less. Well, I have an interview with Andy coming up without you and I'm going to find out if that's true. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. It's always Caesar, yeah. I think just something very practical for me, we do live in a neighborhood and it's a little bit of a hard neighborhood to crack. People come into their, through their garage doors, kind of disappear and go out their garage doors. And it is kind of a great joy for me when I actually get to have a conversation with somebody. And then I really want to know who they are. And I'm going to ask them questions. But it's that longer, slower work, again, of how do we come into a relationship with each other. We're curious about who the actual neighbor in front of us, what is what are the stories that have shaped them? Where do they come from? What is their family story? Yeah. call the the big questions but those take long that takes time sometimes you you can go really deep with somebody quickly but sometimes it is something that's developed over time and that could be anything from relationships in a, in a family to friendships to strangers to people you actually live near but it really does start with that central thing of being willing to be with people to want to take the time to know who they are, to have some curiosity and to share that back and forth. Yeah, that that's really important to me. And I think it speaks a lot to what you got. What you just described, sis, is a heart of love. Like mm-hmm. you care. You you see the image bearing going on and you're curious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know what's your version of that image bearing God's allowing you to bring. Exactly. That. Exactly. That's... And and value yeah. that and value the individual as Jesus does. And yeah. Yeah. All right, last question, Charlie, and this comes kind of out of some things in the book. What is the single most important thing Christians miss about being a Christian? Uh The most important thing that I've seen Christians miss about being a Christian is that you're not at war with anyone. The battle has been won. Everything that you need for life has been achieved for you in Christ's death and resurrection. And you can begin to live a life of peace within yourself, with your family and neighbors. And there's nothing that you can do to make God love you more and love you less. Those are the things that we all long for deeply and tend Mm -hmm. to miss. And we talk about it on every single episode, is that Jesus has come and given his life and been with us and is with us in spirit that we might have spiritual freedom and relational peace now yeah not yeah, someday exactly. we'll fly away but really now and yeah we do and you it. see that you see that in our culture you see a huge swath yeah. of american christians fighting for something yeah and struggling and being you know so angry and they're they're fighting a fight that 
I can understand it intellectually, but I don't understand it in light of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And we really believe that you're never going to win the culture or um, create a movement by based on what you're against or who you're against. Right. But what are you about? Who are you for? And we see in yeah. Christ that he's with and for everybody. Yeah, yeah exactly. You think about the person that you're just so angry about politically, and we all have them, right? You know, intellectually. Yeah. It, but Jesus is for that person. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Changes it, right? Oh. All right. Well, we like to wrap up with the big three takeaways. What would be the biggest three things you would want people to take away from either our talk or maybe something from the book that we didn't even hit on? But here again, they're not, mm -hmm. they just real quick thoughts. What do you think? Anything come to mind? I always think of Mother Teresa's small things with great love. Francis Schaeffer's, there are no little places, no little people. And the sovereignty of God inside of or over the top of that we are in this life, not just waiting for the next life, but living our very earthy life of details of which the place that God has given us to live and how uh, those are all the things that matter to him or to great. us. And it, great. it really elevates the meaning of it all. Yeah, that's Those great. That's great. Uh, I'd say learn the word of God and learn God's work, which is God's creation. That they're both your teachers. And through that, you'll learn that you live in a world of non-neutrality. And that's key to understanding why all things matter. And then I'd say be a maker, not a taker. Do make things, do be a person of action, to bring into the world good things, and put away all religious ideas about like what is and isn't, you know, religious or that, that kind of old sacred secular sort of thinking. Just put that away and just say, what is good? And what can I make today that's good? You know, it might be a coffee table one day, it might be a relationship the next. But focus on making good things that um, that bring goodness and delight and beauty and care to people and and make them feel that you know what I was seen and known. Beautiful. Wow. Good. That's a great big three for us to take away and remember and tuck into our hearts. Thanks again, both of you, Andy and Charlie. Thanks for being on with me today and talking mm -hmm. a little bit about these things that are clearly close to your heart and a part of the book. And uh, we'll definitely yeah. give folks a link to that where they can pick that up and, and dig deeper oh, into all that, that stuff. Thank, thank you, you. Caesar. Okay. That was such a fun and encouraging talk. And it was really fun for me too, just to reconnect with Charlie. It's been years since we've got to talk. I hope you'll check out their new book, Why Everything That Doesn't Matter Matters So Much. I put a link for this in the show notes for you. I found myself replaying and thinking about what Charlie said in my mind about how loving someone well has an imaginative and creative nature to it. And he connected that to continuing to love his wife after decades of marriage. And he said, I want to imagine again for what it means to love you. Oh, that was so powerful. And so that creates a fresh season of learning to know this season's version of one another. Like, oh, I want to do that. I want to be that way with Tina. It hits me hard, but in the best possible way. What did you think about that? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that or anything from this episode. Let me know in the Everyday Disciple Facebook group that we've got. You can find that real easily. Everyday Disciple, just search it up in Facebook. You'll find it. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. All right, well, I'm going to wrap it up for today. Next week, I'll be talking about using the gospel to motivate ourselves and others toward a life of mission. So no more carrot and stick, no more begging, no more shooting on people. It's a bunch of stuff I'd wished I'd known a whole lot earlier in our lives and ministry, but I'm going to share it with you. You don't want to miss it. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for joining us today. For more information on this show and to get loads of free discipleship resources, visit everydaydisciple.com. And remember, you really can live with the spiritual freedom and relational peace that Jesus promised every day.